Well, good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. It's Friday. <clears throat> <Woo -hoo. laughs> it's be sunny all next week if you're from British Columbia. So uh, I think in the south coast, you know, it might hit 20, like Thursday, I think, or something like that. So uh, spring is here. It's in the air. And uh, I know everybody's excited to go seeds this year. And uh, thank you for letting me, uh, you know, communicate and, and share some of my ideas. So uh, <clears throat> growing food 12 months a year. So, you know, there's this... Uh, Here's an image of a fellow that loves tomatoes uh, and growing food within a uh, hundred feet of, of where you live. So, you know, generally in Vancouver, your, your properties are about a hundred feet long. So that's why I chose that. So instead of the hundred mile diet, it's more of a hundred foot diet, growing veggies, herbs, flowers, fruits, uh, and things that you enjoy eating. So, you know, this fellow he likes to smoke and, and drink beer and of course have tomatoes. And when I, when I talk about 12 months a year, you know, you, you're looking at this is Cypress, it's snowy, you know, how can you grow food? Well, there's, there's a few ways we're going to talk about. So indoor growing, uh, which is sprouting seeds, microgreens, <clears throat> indoor growing in containers, of course, which includes uh, uh, growing um, herbs. And then, of course, there's balcony and, and container growing on balconies. Uh, and then there's the standard, you know, spring sowing, summer harvest, traditional planting that's going on now. A lot of people, you can see some of the farmers out in the valley are starting to cultivate the, the fields. Excuse me. And then we're going to just touch on summer sowing for fall, winter harvest. So people forget that, you know, you got everything done. It's July. You, you, you cut your last lettuce. Uh, now what do you do? So, you know, using shorter season varieties, uh, cool weather varieties, you can actually have a harvest if you plant in July for October, great time for Thanksgiving. So uh, sprouting, um, Johnny, you know, we used to do this in public, so it was a little easier, but uh, so is it new or is it old? Well, sprouts have been around for well over 5,000 years. Uh, sprouting seeds uh, pretty well in the 1700s uh, helps uh, sailors uh, fight off scurvy. So, you know, you try to bring fresh produce on the ship when they sailed across the Atlantic, it would go bad. But if you brought sprouting seeds, you could use rainwater and sprout your own seeds. So <clears throat> this is how cool it is. A vegetable that will grow in any climate, rival meat and nutritional value, and will mature in three to five days. It can plant, be planted any time of the year and doesn't require either sun or soil, just fresh water. Uh, in, uh, in some cases, it'll rival tomatoes in this vitamin C. Uh, free, you know, there's no waste that actually uh, at all when you, uh, you grow sprouting seeds. Uh, there's a reference just to the ISGA uh, sprouts on, on the, the data. So sprouting seeds are very nice where, you know, if you look at it, let's see in July, if you, if you planted lettuce in the garden, planted lettuce in the pot, you're going to harvest it. Well, what do you usually do when you're at like a all-you-can-eat uh, salad bar? You would have sprouting seeds on top. So the sprouts go really nicely on a variety of different things. Like if you're going to have uh, uh, a party, you know, well, no, no more parties because of COVID. If you're going to have a nice Zoom meeting um, at home, you can sprout seeds three to five days, get a little bit of cream cheese, some bread or some crackers, and have some really nice um, hors d'oeuvres uh, at home. And then, of course, if you're a millennial, you'd like avocado toast. And what's not better than avocado toast is having alfalfa seeds on your, on your, uh, on your toast. The neat thing about sprouting seeds, it's got a, a, a ton of nutrition. So if you look at sprouting broccoli, a lot of, uh, we find a lot of doctors are prescribing it for people that are battling cancer because it has sulforaphane in it. Um, and there's a few different varieties that do have the, the sulforaphane. Um, it said the, that three ounces of sprouted broccoli actually has more nutrition than a whole head of broccoli. If you can imagine, because you're eating the seed, you're eating the, the entire plant. There's nothing that goes to waste. And there's so much energy in there. Um, sprouting alfalfa as well. There's a ton of different nutrients in here. We have it listed in our catalog as well, where there's folic acid, there's uh, vitamin K, vitamin A, B, um, B2, I think, uh, and of course, vitamin C. Tons of nutrition in the sprouted alfalfa. One of the neat things that we, we came across, uh, I don't know if you know about uh, West Coast Seeds, but I go to grocery stores and I look around uh, the country as much as I can to see, you know, why aren't we growing that in Canada? You know, I looked at, uh, at uh, chickpeas and found out that actually, yes, we grow about 100,000 acres of chickpeas in the prairies. So it does grow well here. 
uh, chickpeas uh, have a lot of nutrition. <clears throat> so if you can see on the, the little photo, when you sprout chickpeas, all you need is just that little tail, and then you can make a nice salad from it because it makes it more tender. They start to sprout. And then if you really want it, you can make your own hummus. Very easy, very simple dish to make. So instead of uh, you know getting the, the French onion dip, you can actually have your own hummus that you made, put a little bit of garlic, onion in there, and it's very tasty. Um, how to grow sprouting seeds. So uh, we have it on the website, Sprouting 101 uh, at West Coast Seeds, just to help people out. And all you need is you don't need to buy anything. Generally, you just need a, a used uh, or a cleaned out uh, spaghetti jar or a jar that, you know, a glass jar for a lid because it, it keeps it from getting uh, any plastics or anything else leaching into your food. Um, and when you, when you get your sprouting seeds, you take about a teaspoon of small seeds, for instance, you put them in the jar, you fill the jar halfway up, just make sure that the seeds are covered, swish it around, let it soak for uh, 24 hours. Because the reason why you want it to soak is the seeds are gonna absorb that moisture and that water, and then they're gonna burst their shell. So it's called cracking that seed. And then after that first day, day two, three, four, and five, you're just gonna rinse them three times a day. So, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Keep them in a, 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 a normal room temperature spot, not on top of the fridge, it's too warm, but in, you know, on your desk uh, while you're having Zoom meetings. Uh, and then as long as you keep it rinsed, uh, the, the seeds will keep on growing. Yeah. <clears throat> then once it gets about two thirds full, what I do is I usually put it in the fridge just to slow it down so that you know, it doesn't go bad because when it's too warm, it, it will go bad over a period of time after like five days. So it's better to keep it in the fridge after. There's uh, another way to do it. There's a, this uh, unit that's called a Biosta and it's made in Quebec um, and it's BPA free, free plastic. And these ones are, uh, if you really want to do it in a bigger way. So I find these better to do, uh, to use to do uh, larger seeds. The small seeds, easier in a jar. Um, and the Biosta, it actually uh, drains right to the bottom tray and then you can use that water to actually uh, water your plants at home. And of course you're gonna, you know, Rinse it three to five times a day or three times a day. And then uh, three to five days, you'll have uh, fresh, nutritious greens. Uh, the next thing is uh, microgreens. So microgreens, you can do a ton of different things with microgreens. <clears throat> and the difference between microgreens and sprouts are microgreens are grown in soil. So, and you, for, you want the second set of leaves to pop up and then you're gonna eat the, uh, the plants. Some people actually just pull it right out of the soil, rinse the roots off and eat everything. So you get the, the maximum nutrition. Uh, for those that like to grow a lot of herbs, so like basil and radishes and, and um, some dill, you can do this on a mass scale. I saw fenugreek, um, there's some, uh, some really good uh, recipes for fenugreek and how nutritious fenugreek is. And that one's actually starting to take off as a new, uh, well, new to us variety. Um, so microgreens, uh, the first set of leaves, and then you just take them out. So that you see on this photo with some bread and some, some nice cream cheese, the beets and the, uh, the Swiss chard are just very vibrant in their color. And you'd be amazed at how much the, just a little small, um, uh, plant will taste exactly like the, the produce when it's fully grown. Um, and how to grow microgreens, it's, it's pretty easy. The, we have larger packs for these. Uh, generally the microgreen seeds that we have are, they'll grow to a, a full product. They're just not as good as the full product as they are, of how vigorous they are to, uh, to grow a microgreen because they're meant for microgreens eating in the very small or baby, baby leaf kind of things. So baby leaf lettuce was one of the original uh, things that were like a microgreen where you just eat the small stuff. <clears throat> There's a, a grow light garden that's made by a company that was from Kelowna, now they're in Langley, uh, and it's called Sun Blaster. And this is really cool because it actually has self-wicking map. And it comes with the four trays, everything you see here, except for the seeds in the soil. So if you start one tray, uh, one week and then the tray the next week and then the tray the next week. That way you're constantly in uh, mi uh, microgreens and you can keep them going. Uh, what I found with this, it's got a little trough where you fill the water. Uh, you can actually go away for a good like week and not have to water it because it just absorbs that moisture slowly from, uh, from the trough. Uh, there's smaller ones out there as well that are just easier and they have a grow light <clears throat> and you can do a whole bunch of things. You can see here, we're just doing house plants. Um, 
And the, the biggest thing about the grow lights you use when you're, when you're trying to grow microgreens is making sure that it has a, the spectrum is 6,500 K. Uh, and, and it's important to have that because it just helps the plants grow. Uh, there's a variety of things on the market where you can even just get a light bulb. Uh, you know, West Coast Seeds has them, Garden Works and, and other garden centers have them where I think it's maybe $8, $9. And you just replace the light bulb and it's, it has the, the right spectrum and, and gives the plant light. Uh, the next one is uh, indoor growing, balcony and container growing. Uh, you can see this person, they love growing stuff in the little terracotta plants. And you know, they have a little bit of marigolds, they have some, some other flowers, they have chives going. Chives are very easy and nice, you can get them. <clears throat> Once you plant chives, you can pretty well keep chives going all uh, friendly for a very long time they keep on coming back once you get them established um so a very nice uh, addition to you know salad soups and meals and sandwiches mm -hmm. uh, the, the biggest thing is you know making sure that you grow what you like to eat in the space you enjoy so if you like to sit out in your balcony and you get enough sun uh you can grow certain things so this person they have tomatoes going they have basil they have uh, mint and they have dill and of course a little bit of flowers and some other uh, items that they'd like to see uh, you just got to make sure you check with your strata if you're in a, in a townhouse or a condo that you're allowed to have that in this case uh, these people you can tell they're north facing uh, they don't get very much direct sunlight so plant which you uh, which you can grow so of course ferns ferns just grow like crazy uh, they don't need uh, any direct sunlight as you can see in the forests of British Columbia especially they just grow everywhere in the in the pussy in the thick forest where you know nothing else is really growing but the the ferns will <clears throat> just so they can have some more greenery and, and enjoy your space uh, so container growing so important things for success if you're going to grow uh, herbs and, and other things is the size of container that you're going to uh, grow in Making sure that it's big enough that it, it'll, it'll handle the roots in the system and, and it can grow. So a uh, six inch pot for a, a corn, probably a little bit too small. <laughs> We've demonstrated actually growing in five uh, gallon pots, uh, four corn cobs, and it works as long as you have container soil that's nutritious. What um, fun do you need for corn? Because I've been trying to grow corn at my sister's house and she's north facing, but we're always chasing the sun around. So what kind of sun is ideal for corn? Oh, you need lots. So corn oh, okay. is like a very heavy feeder and a very, it's sun loving. It's like, <clears throat> it's, it needs a lot of heat units. So mm -hmm. like, in, you okay. know, uh, if, if you're north facing, it's going to be tough. If, uh, if, you, uh, if you have a, a south facing spot, it's going to love it. It's going to grow tall, uh, but you, you need to make sure that there's yeah really nutritious soil. Like uh, I always suggest container complete from sea soil. They're a British Columbia family on Vancouver Island, and that stuff is just fantastic. It's made just to plant vegetables right in, and it's uh, army certified for organic use. So yeah. that there's, there's no artificial stuff in there that's, uh, that's not allowed. <clears throat> and then... Um, for yeah so heat and sun so okay. like sweet corn and chilliwack you know it'll get really really hot in chilliwack as we all know <laughs> um and then of course in southern ontario where my family farms from that's where we grew quite a bit of sweet corn um and then you know you have the uh you have to plant it when it both in the beginning of june once the the soil starts to warm up if it's cold and wet like right now it's just going to rot in the field uh, moisture, so <clears throat> controlling moisture. So some plants like it a little bit wetter, some plants like it a little bit drier. So basil, you know, uh, I find the more you neglect basil, the better it does. Um, and then uh, other things like, for instance, tomatoes like it a bit wetter than uh, peppers do, especially hot peppers. Uh, and then there's heat, too much, too little. <clears throat> so if you get uh, black pots and you're, you're on a 16th floor in Vancouver facing west, you need to uh, protect those black pots because they'll absorb too much heat uh, for most of the plants. So uh, the soil needs to be a little bit cooler. Uh, it'll it'll uh, absorb the heat from you know what was from the air around it, but the plant will love the the heat above it. Anytime you get above 32 Celsius, the, the plants aren't going to like it. But if you don't have enough uh, heat, so for instance, you know, you'll hear Brian Minter talk about um, <clears throat> uh, when to plant things out. And the general rule, general rule of thumb 
is uh, nights that over 10 Celsius before you let the plant out tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. So it's got to stay overnight 10 Celsius or else it's too much of a fluctuation and the plants don't grow as well. Okay. I uh, have a question from Lena here. I'm sorry sure. to interrupt you. No um, Lena has a balcony that's north facing too. So I, I know your pain, Lena. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of vegetables can you grow? What I would, I would try is you're going to try leafy greens first. Uh, so, you know, lettuces, kales, uh, mustard, do spinach. Um, you know, what's funny is we tried to uh, send a whole bunch of spinach up north to, um, I think it was Alaska. And they called back saying, oh, well, the spinach is growing. As soon as it comes out of the ground, it starts to go to flower. Well, because mm, yeah. the daylight was too much. It, you know, spinach uh, goes to seed when it knows the days are long because it likes the cool weather. It doesn't like the sun as much. <clears throat> so spinach is a good variety to try. Swiss chard is a good variety to try. Um, garlic is also a good uh, a thing to try. Um, oh, I try garlic. And, and of course, onions. So garlics, you know, they're, uh, you can get some starts now, or you can try, you know, just planting bulbs. They won't be huge bulbs, uh, but you can get bulbs, you know, you can plant it now and then uh, get it by September. Or you okay. just plant it in the pot and then keep it over winter. Uh, <clears throat> like we plant our fields September and then we'll harvest in June, July for garlic. So it takes a long time for garlic. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the varieties. Uh, and of course you can do, excuse me, chives. If you have a light, so if you if you need to, if you're north facing, you might just want to get a light if you're allowed um, uh, to uh, just give that extra little bit of uh, like sun's rays to to the to the the vegetables. So yeah. if they look like they're 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 not doing so well and they're a little bit leggy, uh, just you know get that little uh, that light and a light fixture, and you can turn it on during the day. That way you're not bugging the neighbors with how bright it is, and then it, it'll help it grow a bit. Oh, okay. Okay. I hope uh, that answered your question, Lena. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And then uh, fertilization. So, um, you know, here in, in West Coast Seeds and in our farm here in, in Mission, we don't really use uh, chemicals or anything. We use chicken manure and uh, compost. We get compost from Abbotsford and it's OMRI certified for organic use. And we use the same thing on uh, West Coast Seeds property. <clears throat> um, you know, sea soil is, is a fantastic uh, product as well, just to add and then mulch it in. Um, and it, it just it helps things grow. If you really need, uh, there's a, a company called Gaia Green. He's a, a British Columbia guy, Michael. Uh, they're, they, they're based in Langley now, and his stuff is all certified organic. So you can actually apply his fertilizer right to the plants, and it won't burn them because it's organic, and it's, it's already in a, a powder form for the most part. Uh, next up is uh, days to maturity. So you just got to look at the, the days to maturity. So if you want to you know, plant tomatoes, you need to get them started ASAP because a lot of them uh, need that time, a good eight weeks to get going from seed to a, a start. And then after that, it's about 70 days for the, the plant to mature in full sun. Um, and then if you have something that's 110 days then, and you're trying to grow in a container on your balcony, you just got to make sure that you, you're able to do that without the frost coming and killing it. Um, so the type of variety again, does it do well in wet soil or does the soil need to be a bit drier? Habit, is it tall? Is it low? Is, or is it sprawling? You know, some of the, most of the ch cherry tomatoes are vining. Uh, so they're indeterminate, means they're vining. They just keep on going. And indeterminate are more of the, uh, the beefsteak type, the heavier tomatoes. <clears throat> or of course, there's uh, things like peppers and um, and eggplants that are all determinate. Sprawling, some of the beans or some of the pumpkins, you'll have a big line, that uh, big uh, vine that just keeps on going that needs uh, some room to grow. Uh, root vegetables like carrots. What room does it need to actually grow in the pot? <clears throat> a lot of carrots, you know, my, my two bits is going to be uh, 18 inch deep pot if you're going to grow carrots, just to give them room so they can grow and you have a nice sized carrot. Um, Parthenocarpic type variety. So this was uh, developed for greenhouse growers where you don't need pollinators. <clears throat> so most of the varieties that are out there are tomatoes, cucumbers, there's some peppers, 
And uh, what happens is they don't need pollinators to actually produce fruit. And then the fruit that you do get are usually seedless. So if you live on 16th floor in Vancouver facing west, you can grow some beautiful cucumbers and peppers and tomatoes without having any, um, hum hum any uh, honeybees or any mason bees up, uh, up that high. If you do have bees or flies that actually cross, uh, that pollinate your varieties, you'll just have seeds in, in the cavity, which is fine because then you can save them and, and grow it again. Um, we have some free information at West Coast Seeds on when to start things and when to uh, plant it directly in the ground. So that's, uh, I think, on page four of our catalog this year. <clears throat> and you'll see different uh, information in there on, on suggestions. And of course, it's, it's, it's uh, our best guess for the region. So like out here in Mission, I'm about three weeks behind that. Out in Delta, it's pretty well bang on uh, uh, that, that listing. Uh, next is urban growing and container growing. So, you know, here you see a six inch pot, it's got lettuce growing in it. It's uh, very nice, you know, with nice soil. You can actually, generally my wife and I, we try to cut and come, uh, we cut and come again, any variety we, we plant, even broccoli. So if you see lettuce like this, you, uh, you let it grow out, you cut it two inches above the soil, and then it should grow back. As long as you keep it consistently moist, it shouldn't go bitter. There's a, a few varieties like Grand Rapids lettuce, a very old variety from the 40s, 1940s. And uh, I think we had seven cuttings and it never went bitter. We just kept it consistently moist so it didn't have big fluctuations in, in uh, dryness. Um, herbs in containers. <clears throat> so what we like to do is, is just ensure that um, the, the container is going to be big enough to hold the, the, the herb that grows so that when it gets a little bit bigger in full maturity, the pot's not going to fall over easily. And if it, it is one, like on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the pots are a bit thinner. You just got to group them together. So in there, there's, I think there's bergamot, there's mint, there's uh, sage, and, and I think there's two different types of sages and some basil. As long as you group them together and there's a breeze, it's not going to necessarily knock them over. It's almost like how a forest works. Uh, on the left, you can see we're, we, we have uh, a variety of different herbs in a one round pot. We like to keep like the, the perennial type herbs together. So there's lemon balm, there's thyme, there's... Uh, rosemary in the one and then we actually we even have like a salad blend in the other one with the kale blend in the other one too <clears throat> and then for like uh, herbs that are more annual like dill and cilantro they're much faster producers and growers so we try to keep those in, in a separate pot that is consistent here's an example of what we did uh, at our house uh, where i have these uh, hanging baskets so i did siam queen basil in it. And I have like a little drip line that goes in there to water it. And with some nice sea soil uh, container complete, you can see the, the basil was so vigorous, it started shooting to the bottom of the plant. So the roots started growing through the, the coir. Um, here's bush baby. This is a nice little zucchini. So if you have enough sun, you can grow this in just in the five gallon pot. <clears throat> it doesn't have a huge habit that sprawls out. It, it keeps it fairly compact. And those are nice uh, varieties. Here's an example, we did this trial. These are 15 gallon pots, but we grew uh, three huge uh, cabbages, full size cabbages that are meant for the field, but in a 15 gallon pot. And then they just kind of pushed each other to the side and, and then angled out and they had enough sun and they grew. <clears throat> Here's an example of uh, Mountain Merit and Tasty Lee uh, tomatoes with uh, I think Milena uh, pepper can't really see the peppers because it's inside the tomatoes the tomatoes overwhelmed it however if the the pepper is getting enough sun and it's, it's actually nice because it's shading the fruit so it doesn't get that sun scald uh, it's very productive and these uh these are 10 gallon um pots for these tomatoes we had to stake them because there's so much here's an example of just uh, growing in containers growing beets uh, of course, you can always eat the beet greens. So beet greens are a fantastic uh, source of uh, nutrition. And then, of course, the beets themselves. So we like to actually uh, use a mandolin and slice them up and make beet chips in the oven. <clears throat> and here's an example. I was using, I was just trialing certain things where uh, growing normal type tomatoes and normal type cucumbers in a, a little hanging basket. The hanging basket is only 12 inches deep. 
<clears throat> so what I had to do is you can see the cucumbers with all the flowers. I actually had to tie twine to the stem just because once the fruit starts to come, it's going to pull the plant right out of the soil because it's so heavy. So I just tie the, the string along the stem. Make just, just make sure that it takes the pressure off the plant so it doesn't go in, uh, rip it right out and then fall over. <clears throat> um, West Coast Seeds, we, we try to give back and teach people how to grow fruit even in Calgary. So our, uh, our staff member in Calgary did this function called Aggie Days where there's 48 uh, busloads of kids every day. And uh, we, we teach them how to grow food and, and we, uh, we give them some seeds and we plant the seeds with them. So Bobby uh, grew all this stuff in March in her house in her basement. So you can see she even has beans growing on the right or left. And on the right-hand side, she's got basil and she's got cucumbers growing with uh, tons of flowers for the cucumbers and some cucumbers already growing. And of course, very easy is potatoes in containers and in the field. <clears throat> so this little guy's not happy, but he's gonna, he got planted. So uh, the, the little potato uh, bags that you can buy at, uh, at the hardware stores and the garden yeah. centers. So um, I know everybody sees in Pinterest and, and other social media where, oh, I planted two potatoes and I got 1,600 pounds and this is what I did. Well, it's not necessarily true. Uh, the general rule of thumb is for every seed potato you plant, you get five to 10 potatoes, okay? So if you only plant three potatoes, you, most you're gonna expect is 30 potatoes. So what I did was I, uh, <clears throat> I used about uh, five inches of compost in the bottom, put five potatoes, seed potatoes, smaller ones and I put soil more to um, more um, compost on top I let it grow out through the top of the uh, the pot so I saw the, the green in the, um, all the leaves coming up and then I put five more potatoes more compost and let that grow up and I could see the leaves come up and I, I repeated it until I got to the top of the bag and by the time I got to the top of the bag um, and it went green, uh, the leaves again. Uh, we were about uh, August or September, and I got about 30 pounds by doing that. And I think I had four layers of potatoes in there. So it works, but you, the potatoes are smaller because they don't have room to stretch and grow. They seem to know. And one of the interesting things that we trialed and we have is actually um, potato from seed. So very tiny seeds, you grow it like a tomato, um, and see how in my hand there, the little green ones. And then once they become a seedling, then you plant that seedling and then you're going to get five to 10 potatoes. Just wow. easier to handle versus some, some of the heavy sacks of seed potatoes you have out there. Yeah. And then of course, garlic. So this is in our yard, garlic that, uh, you know, I left in a pot. It's, it's growing. Um, you see me pulling it out there. That's uh, red Russian. And all you really need is some good nutritious, you know, compost, and then uh, the garlic just grows. And even uh, what's really nice about garlic is you get two harvests. So if you grow the hard neck types, they're the ones that have the scape. It's that stem that comes up and it, and it goes around and makes like a little piggy tail. So before it makes the, the little piggy tail, cut it and use it like an onion. Very garlicky. It's, it's probably more garlic flavor in that than it is in the garlic. So that you'd get like in June. Uh, or may depending on uh, on how your garlic's doing and then uh, you cut that so what happens is once you cut that the more energy goes into the bulb so it makes a bigger bulb but then you get to eat the garlic ahead of time and then of course gardening for family members <clears throat> so this is my cat boots and uh, he loves barley grass so cat grass generally you can use oats wheat barley and then uh, orchard grass uh, so you know that, that barley right there is maybe six days old. It's exceptionally vigorous. Um, just some nice uh, moist uh, starter mix. You just got to put the barley in there. There's so much nutrition in there. The cats just like to browse it. We have some customers at the market that buy it for their guinea pigs and for their turtles. And they just let them uh, browse it. Uh, spring sowing, summer harvest, uh, the traditional planting. Uh, here, I'm just going to go through some... Um, things for success, uh, the area that you intend to take care of. I have a tendency to, to do too much and then take on too much. And then I have uh, tons of weeds and other things. So I've created a system using landscape fabric where I burn the holes in the landscape fabric. So there's way less uh, effort that's needed to keep it clean. Um, what type of soil do you have? Do you have heavy clay like it is in Delta or do you have uh, sandy soil? <clears throat> 
you know, is your soil acidic? If it's acidic, then sometimes you need to use lime or just you, uh, amend with uh, compost to, to kind of mediate it, keep it so it's a, a little bit less acidic. It'll, it'll absorb some of that. Uh, does it have direct sunlight or partial shade? And then what's the winter like versus the summer? which matters because if there's hardly any light in the winter time uh, because the tree line is higher, then you might have some challenges with garlic or other things. Uh, do, and again, heat, too much or too little? Does it get piping hot inside your greenhouse? Uh, you might need to ventilate or is it too cold where you, know, you have frost all the time? Uh, moisture, you know, what, what moisture does that plant require? If it's uh, an area that is a little bit soggier or, or holds moisture much longer, you might want to plant uh, varieties that uh, like more moisture. <clears throat> um, like some squash will do okay, but if it's too wet, then they'll just rot. Nutrients fertilization again with uh, organic compost and, uh, and mulch. So when, when the dry periods come, like, you know, July and August, when we have some of those, it hasn't happened for the last few years, but sometimes if you, everybody remembers where, you know, the rain pretty well stops in June, doesn't come back till September. Uh, how do you keep the moisture in the soil? And it's easy. You mulch, mulch, mulch. You know, I use compost. Other people use uh, some plastics and other things so that the moisture doesn't leave the soil fast. And that way you're, you're not sitting there trying to water all the time. Um, and then there's also using other plants intercropping. So part of intercropping is uh, us teaching people uh, and bringing back clover is one of the major uh, things that are, are kind of really neat and really helpful in soils. So in Saskatchewan, where they're doing like thousands of acres of sweet corn and corn organically, they're planting clover in between the rows when they plant the, uh, the corn. And what happens is the clover will absorb nitrogen from the air and put it into the soil and its leaves. So not only is it blocking weeds out because it's growing as clover and it's shading the ground, keeping the moisture in the ground, as the corn grows up and it grows up past four feet, it starts to not let light into the ground in the soil. So then it keeps that moisture and then the clover dies back and of course lays on the, on the ground and keeps that moisture and keeps the weeds down. And then eventually breaks down into uh, more nitrogen. Here's an example of some big honking pumpkins. So if you have a, a balcony, you might not want to try to grow one. These are, I think, 600 pounds, these things. Um, and of course, you know, it's not all about vegetables. So this is a customer of ours uh, in the lower mainland. They don't like uh, vegetables as much, but they love our wildflower mixes. So they made their own area. And then uh, the wildflowers just grew really well for them. They just really enjoyed it. Uh, on the left, you can see that's the deer resistant blend with the poppies. And on the right, I think it's the Pacific Northwest blend. And, you know, they enjoy their space. They get a cup of coffee in the morning. They sit out in between Zoom meetings now. And, and they just... Yeah. Uh, one of our staff members, she, uh, she was uh, heavily into growing food for the family. So this is in South Vancouver. You can see she has sweet corn in the front yard, huge... Uh, um, sunflowers and then in the backyard or husband you can hardly see them uh, they have so much kale so much squash that it's just growing like crazy and of course they're saving it and using it for uh, for later uh, integrating vegetables with perennial plants so this is our backyard where we have a lot of hostas and a lot of uh, rhododendrons and <clears throat> other perennial type uh, plants that come back um, you can see how much moss is actually on the uh, sidewalk I should clean that um, but you know, we interplant like little vegetables in there for the summertime. So, you know, basil will grow well in there and uh, other little varieties that we can actually just browse as we're walking through. <clears throat> On this side, you see how we're, we're actually in the forest and we have, a, you know, it's pretty uh, acidic, I'd say. Uh, I don't really put line down. I just put compost and it, and it works for us. Uh, things grow, dill grows and, and other little plants. And of course, blackberries grow really well. Um, on an edge of a forest, so this is uh, on the edge here, and what I did was, you know, the, there's, you know, cedar wood chips there, but I put compost down and grew a ton of kale. Kale didn't need that much light. Um, it did fantastic the, that year. I changed it out, put uh, some other stuff this year, but um, yeah, we had a nice kale harvest. And it will tolerate some salty soils. I, I find tomatoes also are tolerant of salty soils. Peppers, not as much. <clears throat> or lettuce. 
Uh, another idea is a flower bank with veggies. So here is one of our, uh, our breeders. They planted a huge uh, long row. I think it was 600 feet of flowers on each side. And what you see in the center is actually scarlet kale. Uh, they've harvest, harvested some of it, but what they do is, you know, as they, they need the kale, they'll just pop in, grab a, a bunch of kale, and then uh, they're out of there. <clears throat> so it's got two purposes. Not only is it beautiful, but it also feeds them. Uh, veggies for edible garden features. So uh, this is an AS uh, winner. This is a rosy basil, that purple basil. And then of course on the inside is an ornamental pepper. Ornamental peppers you can eat. They're just not as uh, uh, flavorful as the, the, the edible type. But you know, here it's, it's just nice because you the whole thing is edible and, and it's beautiful. Um, we have another example of, of using these uh, wine barrels, those half-cut wine barrels. So we have three things in here, and uh, <clears throat> you can see the the, uh, the determinant type. It's uh, There's eggplant in there, and there's peppers. And, of course, the beans are pole beans. So what happens is the pole beans will wrap around that barrel and keep on growing, and you'll have beans um, as well as uh, peppers and eggplants. Here's some information on just how to get started um, to establish the garden, identify perennial plants you like, and then the space they require when in full bloom. The biggest thing is trying to Im imagine how big it's going to be once it's in full bloom. I have a tendency to overplant. Um, I, I plant very intensely because, <clears throat> uh, you know, in order to, like I plant a lot of, for instance, sugar snot peas, very intense because they like it cooler. Uh, I know that. So then I just plant it very intensely and then get a, a big harvest off it because I use compost all the time. Uh, but other plants, they don't like when they're that close. So uh, something like uh, a carrot or garlic, for instance, if garlic is too close to another garlic, there'll be smaller garlic. Uh, and then, of course, which areas are full sun, which have limited sun, companion planting and intercropping ideas, uh, growing what you like to e eat and enjoy. If you don't like to eat it, don't plant it, um, but you know sometimes it's just pretty to see, and then you just give it to your neighbors, and then you're the you're the hero of the neighborhood because you're giving everybody food. Um, <clears throat> a suggestion is uh, herbs, growing them closer to where you'll have access to them, and use them. So you know don't plant herbs where it's really hard to reach into the the garden. Plant a little bit closer to where the kitchen is, so that you know whether it's in a pot and the windowsill in the kitchen or um, just outside the kitchen, so you can just grab some scissors. Uh, browse what you need, pinch off what you need, and then bring it on in and have some very fresh uh, herbs to cook. Um, varieties that have longer days of maturity, farther inside your raised bed. So if you have a raised bed that's four by eight or areas that you have to reach into, just, you know, the longer days of maturity varieties on the inside and then the, the ones that are faster, closer to, to the front. An example, lettuce. Lettuce is uh, generally 45 days and it's faster. Radishes will be similar. Uh, <clears throat> so growing seeds starting for like woody herbs like lavender, rosemary starting in January and February. Um, I think it's uh, uh, 14, 16 weeks to, before you're going to plant it out. Uh, the woody herbs do take much longer, especially like tarragon and um, rosemary uh, and uh, sage, I find. Peppers, 10 to 12 weeks before you plant it out. And what I mean by planting out is the average days when you plant, you plan on getting it into the, uh, the ground outside or if it's going to be in a pot or in inside of its own greenhouse. Tomatoes, eggplants, about eight weeks before you're going to plant them out. And then squash, cucumber, six weeks. So it gives you some time because, you know, peppers first, and then two weeks later, you're planting tomatoes. Two weeks later, you're planting squash and cucumbers. Squash and cucumbers, you can also direct sow very easily because they're very vigorous once that soil heats up. Um, and then, of course, uh, right now we're in April, so now's the time where you can plant lettuce, peas, kale, corn salad, chicory, and dive um, outside right away. They're gonna they're gonna sprout and they're gonna go. Um, even to extent, if you want to plant, um, uh, you can replant garlic and and some other things. When it comes to beans and corn, you have to get that let that soil warm up. I've tried it a bunch of ways. There's uh, one way that does work is you can use uh, like uh, clear plastic to heat the soil up or that uh, ground cover, Rime, I think it's called, it's, it's a white cloth or a bed sheet, uh, just to keep it so that it, it heats, uh, heats the 
soil up a little bit more and it protects it from the cool nights. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people use the grow light garden to, to do their own seedling starts and um, label what they're growing. Is this a commercial uh, grow light or can you get this at like Costco, for example? Oh, our, Costco wouldn't have some blaster, but uh, every garden center would have it. West Coast Seeds has it. Uh, this this uh, type of grow light? Oh yeah, home hardware would have it. Okay. So it's it's just called uh, uh, a grow light garden from uh, Sunblaster. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they have it on Amazon, but um, you, yeah, you can get it pretty well anywhere. Um, and then, so this is the one that has self wicking. So before I I do my my starts in here, so it'll hold one of those one twenty eight trays. So it has one hundred twenty eight cells, nice. or it'll do a whole bunch of other things. So it, they're readily available, and there's smaller versions. These ones are they're fairly expensive now. I think they're 300 bucks, but there's cheaper ones out there that are about $6. And it was that image I showed you with the, uh, the house plants in it. Yeah. So if you, if you, uh, yeah, you can go online and check it out, but some blaster, they're very nice people. They really try a lot of stuff constantly in their office just to make sure that their, their equipment works really nice, nice people. And again, they're based out of Langley. Uh, and then here's uh, an example of West coast seeds, uh, greenhouse where we have white on the on the floor um, that white uh, landscape fabric reflects the light up we don't necessarily need heat we have a heater in there but it really helps the plants develop and grow well <clears throat> uh, so that was uh, i think uh, a couple years ago for our seeding sale next thing is summer sowing for fall harvest so here's a, we lived in Port Moody at this time, and this is all the stuff that I got out of the thing. So we had apple and apples from an apple tree, zucchini, like crazy carrots, of course, squash, there's, there's um, onions and there's garlic and, and of course, pumpkin for pumpkin pie. <clears throat> Summer planting for fall harvest. So say you, uh, you're on, you're north facing and you're, you're finished uh, harvesting some lettuce, what can you grow now? Well, checking on the day's maturity, you can replant those cool weather varieties like kale and, and uh, onions, uh, like the, 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 the um, what's it, what are they called? The, the, the little onions and then Chives. salad, yeah, salad and onions. There's corn salad, there's lettuce. Uh, if the variety is a warm season, season variety, you just gotta make sure you get it planted early enough. I've tried planting it closer to the end of August. It's just not enough time for, when sometimes we have those surprise punishing rains for like seven days straight it just doesn't work for you um but if you plan your space just looking at you know how fast those things will mature mustard matures very quickly so do radishes and radishes are just nice to add to salads and soups um and then there's some overwintering varieties so uh, you, you might have heard linda gilkinson and then i'm throwing these names out but she talked about a few things where she would actually Harvest the last of her carrots in Victoria, I think, in March. They would overwinter. We do have overwintering broccoli, cauliflower, kale overwinters because kale doesn't go to seed for two years. So, uh, like we have kale all over the place here. And if you let it go to seed, the birds will help you, and then you'll have kale all over the place. And it's good because kale is very nice. Uh, chives, of course, leafy greens, wild greens. Um, uh, here on the coast, you can overwinter some carrots again. Wild greens like dandelions. Yes, dandelions. We actually sell out of dandelions every year. Um, it's very nutritious for you. And it's, it's like the, it's that nice bitter uh, leaf that, that goes with the, the main salad that just gives it some more uh, pepper and taste. <clears throat> you can also use the root of dandelions to make coffee and other things. Plus the, the flowers are edible. Then purslane, you know, we have two different types of purslane. Those are fantastic and very, very hardy in our in our in our world in uh, British Columbia. Miner's letter, which is miner's lettuce, pardon me, uh, which is Claytonia. It's like purslane, and there's cress, there's sorrel that you can grow. So new varieties, get to hear. Anybody have questions? Just interrupt, please. Um, uh, so new varieties. So we, you know, sorry, now, Alex, we have like some question. Sure. So Lina ask, do we need organic seeds for growing organic vegetable? So with the, so we're an organic farm. We don't, it's not a major requirement. Yes, you, you, you should use it. However, for West Coast seeds, we have untreated seeds that are suitable for organic growing. 
means that there's no coating on it. There's no uh, thyrum and all these other chemicals that people put on it to protect it from the bacteria in the soil. So <clears throat> you don't necessarily have to have uh, uh, certified organic seeds. So for West Coast seeds, we don't call something certified organic unless it's nationally certified, where we can sell it to Quebec, we can sell it down to Florida, um, because the Canadian standards are much higher than the American standards. So it could be USDA organic, but it's not Canadian organic in many cases because of certain circumstances. So uh, it could be a, a variety that is, you know, grown in you know, Laconer, Washington, but we just don't accept it as organic up here, but it's still suitable for organic growing. I hope that answers your question. And she has like a sub question to that. Um, where can she buy organic seeds? Well, uh, West Coast seeds for sure. Um, <laughs> So here, I'll show you. I don't know if you guys can see this picture, but this is sorrel. And you can see the little, or is the picture? There's the logo there. That's the certified organics logo from Canada. If you see that, then you know that that seed is certified organic. You have to, we actually go through three audits for this, uh, verifying that it's certified organic. And it's grown certified organically. You can find certified organic seeds at all garden centers. Uh, just look for that logo. And then if, you know, if it's an American seed company, they'll have the USDA logo, but you know, there, there's a, just a little bit of a difference on what the Canadian standards are and the American standards, our standards are higher, but um, it's still acceptable for organic growing. Okay, hopefully that helps. Awesome. And then now we have a question uh, from Owens from Facebook. Um, so, are there certain herbs that can grow in containers indoor that double as repellent to a feed and even more so to smooth in bedroom that have that frequent challenge? I'm sorry, can you read that again? Yeah. So are there certain herbs that, think, that can grow in containers indoor that double as a repellent to a feed and even more to to moth in bedrooms that have frequent challenge. Aphids and moths. Oh, 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 oh aphids and moths. Woo. <laughs> That's tough, aphids and moths. Um, <clears throat> so if you, if uh, there, most of the herbs you can grow in containers, actually that's how a lot of people grow them. Um, <clears throat> like especially the woody herbs, it's just, they'll be a little bit shorter and you keep on browsing them. Other th things that, that, that can grow inside are very hardy or like, uh, you know, a root, uh, sorry, oregano, excuse me, oregano is very hardy, rosemary is very hardy, excuse me, thyme is very hardy. Um, as a woody plant outside, even the, the, uh, the uh, wild uh, arugula, the silvetta type, it, it grows outside and just keeps on going every year. So those are very hardy, but if you're going to grow it inside, um, you just need to make sure there's light or uh, a light bulb, like, you know, the, the, um, the light with the spectrum over it for six hours a day, minimum six hours, because they need that light. <clears throat> uh, with regard to aphids and moss, if you have that inside, jeez, um, uh, I don't know how to deal with that besides squishing the aphids with your fingers and, and try to, you know, have, uh, there's, uh, there's products out there that are, are called sticky traps. And if you have uh, things that like moss and other things that are around, uh, they're 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 like they're like flypaper in, in other words. And you can put those up. So like thrips, um, we had thrips from the soil, so we put those near the the soil so that the thrips would land on it. They can't get away because it's glue. Um, <clears throat> other than that, is you know trying to have uh, predatory insects around. So um, there's predatory uh, wasps. So wasps aren't very, they're not bad. They're a nuisance sometimes if you're having a picnic and they're hungry, but wasps are meat eaters. So if you have a whole bunch of wasps in the area, you're gonna probably find that you don't necessarily have aphids very much and you don't very have very many other uh, pest insects because the wasp will actually eat the aphids. Um, I know Annie, our farm coordinator, she would, you know, find like these little caterpillars and other things and then she would put it by where the wasps were and then next thing you know the thing's gone because the wasp ate it. Uh, and that's one way to deal with it. 
Uh, <clears throat> then there's also, of course, ladybugs, praying mantises that love aphids and love uh, other insects to eat. Hope that answers it. Okay. Do you so, have, um, uh, we have like another question from him. Sure. Uh, do you still have time or do you want to wait until the end? I got all time in the world. Awesome. Okay, so for choosing plants, what is the most comprehensive physical guide and or virtual database that details the conditions necessary and beneficial for growing success specific to each plant? Seeds. Oh, there's a ton of information. Like we have, we have quite a bit of information in our um, our website on growing on our planting charts. So if you look at our growing guide, uh, each beginning of each category, say for instance cabbage, it'll try to it'll teach you and give you general guidelines on how to grow cabbage. Um, it's just like our sprouting sheet that I showed you: how to grow sprouts, how to grow mm -hmm. microgreens how to grow lettuce, how to grow carrots. So we have general suggestions on how to do it. And, and most of the time it's, you know, uh, as Brian Mentor will say, there's a thousand ways to do the same thing when it comes to growing vegetables and, and, and plants. So it's, it's what you like to do and what you find you have success with. So, you know, reading that information in the, our growing guide would really help uh, if you want information. Um, just on uh, days of maturity that's listed by every product and then uh, in even growing information. So if you look at the seed packs as well, so like here's ours and it'll say, okay, when's the timing, how to do it, and then when do you harvest and the taste. Almost every seed company will have that information on the back of the packet when you buy a packet. And then uh, what spec they are and some other information. So it, what we also have is on the front, as you'll see here, I don't know if you can see that, it's uh, the days to maturity and if it's an open pollinated versus a hybrid. Okay. Awesome. And then Lina has a question. Yeah. Um, how to check if the soil needs water and how to know the soil is water properly when watering garden? Perfect. That's, that's a great question. So I didn't cover that. Is that is an awesome question, yeah. Good question. Okay, so um, <clears throat> when you're planting seeds, so the, the general rule of thumb is moist like a chocolate cake. Not a vanilla cake, but a chocolate cake. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like if you ever, you know, if you, you know, as a kid, grab the chocolate cake, you know, you squeeze it, no water comes out, but it's moist. You know, it's, it's moist. It's not wet and it's not dry. So you want moist. Um, and then some plants like it to dry out a little bit, like peppers. Uh, tomatoes don't mind it being moist all the time. So that, that's the general rule of thumb there. When it comes to commercial growers, so when I talk about that 128 tray, or the, the trays are generally uh, 10 inches by 20 inches. So they call them 1020s. So that tray, when they plant that tray, it generally weighs... 1500 grams when it's got the correct amount of moisture like that's that's the science of, of these commercial guys that grow all the vegetables that you see at costco and you see at the grocery stores when they're doing it at an industrial scale um when they're doing it for like you know uh big you know 16 acre greenhouses 1500 grams uh is that tray and then they keep it that at that weight uh, moisture for I think five days until it germinates and then they bring the the moisture down after the the seeds germinate <clears throat> we all don't have scale so we can't do that but that's just I just wanted to share that information uh, the next step is so for instance you have a garden you have a raised bed um, and it's July and you want to water your garden so the the general rule of thumb that we talk about is if you want to you know Dig your first of all, dig your hand in the soil. <clears throat> if you dig down about, uh, you know, from your your uh, tip of your finger to about where your thumb is, just to see what the moisture is. When you dig down that far and it's all dry, then you need more moisture. So <clears throat> when you water, you water slowly and long. So if you if you uh, water in the morning, you can water for like a half an hour, an hour, and then you wait. <clears throat> and then you're going to water again later on because you know when when you see the droughts in california and all that stuff you get that crust on top of the soil so when they have a heavy downpour that water is not going in the soil it's going out to the ocean because it's it can't the soil can't absorb it fast enough so when you have drier soil 
you'll see that too. It'll puddle on top, but then if you dig your hand in there, you reach down three inches, it's going to be dry as a bone still. So it's all about consistent moist, uh, consistent watering. So you hear people of uh, one inch uh, a week. Uh, we, we try to use drip tape. Um, underneath landscape fabric or mulch. So if you have wood chips, you have other mulch like compost. I talk about compost a lot because it's fantastic. The compost will take the brunt of the sun, but right below the, like an inch below the compost, it's going to be moist because it holds that moisture in the soil. So <clears throat> to go over again, uh, you know, before you water, dig your hand in the soil or use a little shovel just to see two, three inches down how much moisture is in there. If it's wet already, don't bother. It's just the top that's starting to dry out a bit. You can give it a light um, sprinkling, but you're more, you're more interested on what's happening down below than on top, unless of course you're planting seedlings or planting directly. Hopefully that helps. Mm -hmm. And okay. last question I'm seeing is like for growing sprouts, do we need to cover the jar to see, to see it in dark? No, you don't have to cover the jar. So I've done it a, a few different ways when we have our, our shows to demonstrate it. <clears throat> the biggest thing is just how do you uh, strain it? So like you, 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 you can use cheesecloth. You can buy the, the little lids that we have where it's got a whole bunch of holes on the, on the jar or use your hand. You know, I've used my hand. With, when it's bigger seeds, it's easier because then they don't fall through your fingers. But <laughs> any way you can strain it, you can strain it. Uh, and then... Um, just so that it's rinsed three times a day. And that way you just get the, the, the seeds, you keep them moist, but then they get uh, air touching them as well. And that helps them grow. Okay. So uh, going on to the new variety. So, uh, you know, besides going to uh, the grocery stores, we also go for food. So this is a Korean restaurant image. And, um, Brian uh, Campbell is, is uh, the product manager for Seeds as well as myself, and uh, we're always looking. So, you know, what's more fantastic than, you know, you see the squash. The squash are a little bit smaller, and um, <clears throat> we notice a trend for more empty nester families, fa smaller families, and not the, you know, the big six and eight uh, children families where um, you want a little bit smaller fruit, so there's less, less leftovers. You don't have to deal with all the, you know, trying to save it, put it in the fridge, oh, you forget about it where some of the kombucha squash or the curry squashes, you slice it in half, it's perfect for two people. Here's an example of, you know, there's this pork, there's onions, there's, uh, there's garlic, there's sesame seeds in there, there's carrots on top and it's just baked and it's just a, a very, very nice meal uh, for two Excuse people. Me. Excuse me, Alec, oh, there. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, the screen wasn't changing, so. Oh. Not where we're locked, now it is. Okay, there yeah. you go. Uh, so new for this year, um, we have some really cool new stuff. So Belizea is a, is a new uh, organic uh, arugula, very nice and compact plant uh, and very peppery. Uh, <clears throat> we have uh, Subeto beets, certified organic. So they're very good and, and fast. So these ones are 50 days. So, you know, beets can be 45 to 55 days. Uh, these ones are, are just exceptional at, uh, 40 to 45 days uh, when you can eat the beet greens. Uh, Nutri Red, we brought this back. We love this carrot because it's just got a really nice color, very vigorous, it's 60, uh, 76 days, open pollinated. And uh, it's it's got a, a lot of, of lycopene, which is good for you. I forget why. Uh, Autumn King, also certified organic carrots. Uh, very nice variety that it's just, uh, it's like a Bolero carrot. So they're, they're like a nonce type carrot and they're about six inches long. Uh, Viper is more like a sugar snack. So you can see how long they are. Uh, I think the, the longest one that we, we saw at the, the trials is the 18 inches. So they're very thin on the bottom, but uh, they're very tasty. <clears throat> uh, one of our, our, our customers uh, wanted Dutch cutting, cel uh, Dutch cutting celery. So this celery, you don't get this, the heavy stalks, you use it for the, the leaves. And it's very nice and, and uh, tastes like celery, of course, but uh, it's good for soups and salads and, uh, and a variety of things. Uh, bringing back chickpeas. So chickpeas grow really well. You can use chickpeas in, in a variety of dishes. Uh, just, it just adds quite a bit uh, to each meal, and especially substance. Uh, glass gem corn. This is really cool, this corn. 
So not one single cob will be identical in color to another cob. It's, it's that various, uh, it has that much variance in its color. And this is more of an ornamental corn. You can use it for popping, but it's more of uh, something that you'd use for uh, making um, a flower, let it dry out. <clears throat> this one is definitely good for flour. So I, I, I really like this variety. We saw it in uh, down south and it's just such, it's so deep in color. It grows about seven to eight feet tall, but the, uh, the cobs are amazing. And it's great for uh, making flour to make uh, tortilla chips. Space Master, this is a, a very nice uh, uh, cucumber for small spaces and, and containers like a, a five gallon pot. Uh, it doesn't sprawl too far, but you can always trellis it up so that the, the cucumbers are off the ground. Uh, very nice variety and very tasty. Even though they got, excuse me, big, uh, they are still very tasty. Comanche is just another addition to our, our organic leeks. Um, this one, uh, shoot, I forgot the... Um, the days of maturity, but it's a, I think it's a longer day to maturity leak and very tasty. <clears throat> so easy leaf blend, it's a one cut uh, type lettuce. Uh, so the, the good folks over at uh, uh, Richmond Sharing Farm, they grow this, they grow Hampton and uh, uh, Capulin types. We made a blend of it. And what it's for is uh, market gardeners and of course homeowners where you plant a, a, a lettuce and if you see on the right hand side, uh, you grab the lettuce, uh, you cut it two inches from the soil. And then <clears throat> what happens is there's, there's not a core in there. And what you rinse it off with the hose, you let it go and it turns into eat, uh, baby leaf lettuce. It just breaks up so that there's no thing holding it all together. And now you just cut it once and you're ready to have a salad. Uh, Cracovinus, uh, this is just a, a really nice uh, uh, lettuce where it's got softer leaves. It's not as crunchy. So some people like the softer uh, leaf lettuce. And this is uh, just a, an exceptional variety and it's organic. <clears throat> Home run. So we have two mainstay uh, ca um, um, cantaloupe in our lineup and it's called Early Champ and Halona. And Home Run really stood out uh, in, in, in comparison to those two. It, it really, you know, it, it stood up to them because they're very productive uh, cantaloupe. So this one is just as productive. The quinoa peppers. These are cool. So I was on, uh, before COVID, uh, um, some functions where, you know, we have the big uh, dinners or there's 10 people at a table and blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, the chefs ad actually added these peppers to all the salads and they're just fantastic. They're very small. Like they're the size of not even near your thumb, <clears throat> but they're just nice. They have a little bit of a bite to them, not too much, just a nice bite. And of course there's a yellow. So just in case you want to grow a nice little pepper and then be able to put on your salads, just as instead of having to chop it up, you just rinse it and throw it on. Uh, the cucamelon would be very similar if you guys are familiar with that, that Mexican gherkin. Those are small little cucumbers. They love the heat, but uh, they're, they're about the size of uh, like your thumb. <clears throat> uh, white icicle is, the, is more of a... Um, daikon type radish uh, they grow very long very nice for soups and salads and and uh, stews uh, skookum is a it had a terrible name so we renamed this uh, spinach skookum because it's called c2606 uh, <clears throat> it's just there it was a name the number that it had before it went uh, public so it's 25 days to maturity for baby leaf a very productive uh, spinach and this one's grown in laconer washington Salsoa, uh, which is saltwort. We were surprised by this. So we didn't have a salty place to plant it, but this plant is uh, sown so that you can actually take up soil from the soil, take up salt from the soil. <clears throat> so if you live on the coast, uh, like, you know, on Vancouver Island and other places like the Sunshine Coast, you can plant this and they get a bit of a salty taste that you can add to salads. It's more of like a succulent. Like you can see some of the, it's very hard to get a photo of this puppy because it was four feet high and it was huge and we kept on eating it. Uh, all the staff, it's just, it just didn't stop producing. <clears throat> but the stems are like little succulents. 
Uh, Honey Boat is a new squash, certified organic, um, and it's 100 days. So it's a little bit longer, but it was bred by the University of Oregon. So, uh, you know, sticking to the West Coast, we like this type of uh, squash, and uh, that's our new one. Uh, Moringa, this one is a neat pumpkin. <clears throat> very, uh, very noticeable, you can say, uh, in the field and in also when you have it on your porch and other places, but it has a very nice taste to it. So <clears throat> they're about four to eight pounds. Uh, the fruit's light colored um, and 95 days uh, to maturity from direct sowing into the ground. Most of the pumpkins are 100, 110 days. Here's a neat story, Roadster. Um, Roadster, there was a staff member at West Coast Seeds that uh, worked at West Coast Seeds about 20 years ago. He uh, left and became a tomato breeder down in Florida. <clears throat> so he came up with uh, Roadster and, oh my gosh, I forget the other name, but they both pretty well won awards. He did a fantastic job. So the Roadster is actually um, uh, more of the beefsteak type. Um, and yeah, you see there is 12, in, 12 ounces. So, and it's got some really good disease resistance. Uh, the next one is uh, get stuffed. We had a stuffing tomato, uh, but we found that it wasn't big enough and it, it, the, the walls weren't thick enough. So we, uh, we trialed a, a bunch of them and get stuffed was just an amazing variety. You see the striations and we grew these all in pots <clears throat> in our greenhouse uh, just to show how nice and uh, big they got. Very blocky, very nice, easy to, to clean out the, the inside and be able to stuff it with like pork and onions and other things. Um, silky sweet. So the, the mainstay uh, salad uh, type turnip is like the hackeroy, what you'll see in a lot of the uh, the markets. Silky sweet is uh, it's it's uh, its competitor. And it's it's a uh, it's pretty fast. I, I planted both of them side by side last year. And wow, the silky sweet, it really, it was much faster than the hack rye and it tasted just as good. So very nice uh, uh, salad turnip. You need it like an apple, 35 days uh, maturity from planting. This one's kind of neat, Dolce Fresca basil. You'll see this in some of the, the uh, um, hardware stores that are selling basil. Dolce Fresca is a very nice basil. <clears throat> You'll see it's got a really thick stem and, and holds its uh, upright habit. And it's very tasty, especially if you're gonna use it for pesto. Uh, New Far is back in stock. We had a, a crop failure uh, for a couple of years and now um, it's back in stock. And it's got a better resistance to fusarium wilt, which is uh, something that attacks it. And of course, this one's certified organic. Emerald Tower, I don't know if you see Annie. So Annie's our farm coordinator. You can see how big that basil is compared to Annie. Like, wow, what an exceptional <clears throat> variety. So this Emerald Tower type, uh, there's a whole series that that breeder did. So there's, uh, I think he called it Everleaf. So there's an Everleaf Emerald Tower. There's an Everleaf uh, Thai basil that is just, produ just as productive. And then there's another Genovese type um, I like this, the flavor and the taste, and it's just fantastic on how upright it grows so that you don't have anything that's even close to the ground. So when the, the rain hits the, <clears throat> the soil, it doesn't bounce up and touch the leaves easily because it's so upright. Here's an example of uh, the tower series and what they look like in our, our, uh, our trial fields. You can see we use landscape fabric a lot just to keep the weeds down because we're, we're organic. We don't use chemicals. Uh, here's a picture of sushi. And you're, why is sushi in this? <laughs> well, uh, as everybody knows, there's that green piece of plastic whenever you get take out sushi. Well, what's the plastic supposed to be? Well, it's actually supposed to be perilla, shiso. So shiso leaves, the green ones, is, that's what it's supposed to represent. <clears throat> so if you go to like a high-end uh, uh, sushi place, you'll actually get the leaf. Uh, we have three varieties now. So we have green, we have purple, and we have ojiso, which is green on one side, purple on the other. So we, uh, we actually donated, uh, I think, uh, 30 feet of our plants to uh, uh, one of our staff members, Japanese, to the Japanese Cultural Club, and they juiced it. And they, 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 th they said it was just fantastic. Some of our customers actually said that perilla is, uh, is a perennial in the, in the lower mainland if you take care of it. So it'll come back every year. <clears throat> we haven't been able to do that because we haven't actually left it out in the field. We always bring it in. Um, 
The next one is Peruvian Black Mint. So Peruvian Black Mint, if you don't like cilantro, there's people that love cilantro and people that hate it. Uh, this is an alternative uh, for you. Peruvian Black Mint, uh, this plant grew four feet high with, and it was just exceptional. It's got a, a nice minty flavor, a citrusy minty flavor with just a hint of uh, cilantro. Uh, Mandarina Orange, and this is, um, shoot, is it? We have two different types. Oh no, this is this is the um, lemon balm. So this is an orange balm. Oh, if anybody nice. ever had the lemon balm, you know how it's very very fragrant. This is mm. our version of that, but in orange. And of course, it's deer resistant. The deer don't like it. <clears throat> Here's the other one. It's orange yellow time. So it, this one's a time, but it's orange yellow. It's got a, a slight orange fragrance to it. Very nice for dishes, and it's perennial. Uh, some new flowers, China Aster, King Size Apricot. These were just uh, outstanding in our in our, our trials with, uh, you know, almost a meter high tall, these, these uh, flowers. And then you can cut it for cut flowers and, and then be able to uh, um, pot them up. Uh, Celiosa, Bright Lights Formula Mix. I like these. I know some people don't like them because they're too bright, but it just brings a pop of color to certain areas where it's just green. Um, <clears throat> and you need some, some colors, so those are very nice. Um, Colencia, uh, Chine Houses. These are exceptional for bees and, of course, for um, hummingbirds. <clears throat> you can see the, the way that the flowers are. And the, the bees just go after it and they just love it. Chrysanthemum painted daisies. Uh, we just, we found this daisy just uh, exceptional where you look, you look at the vibrant uh, different colors in there. Um, and it's great for cut flowers as well. Uh, we don't have a daisy, so we picked up this daisy. Uh, this is part of the All-American Selection Trials. Uh, this uh, Shasta daisy, is, it's just a blanket of them. So it's its hardy to zone three. So, you know, maybe not Calgary, but it should be hardy and uh, to, to come back and be a perennial here. They grow uh, 10 inches high, so not even a foot, but very productive on its flowers. Honeywort, <clears throat> this one, wow, dude. The bees go after it. <clears throat> bees just love it because they can go right into that flower and it's got tons of nectar. It's, uh, it's, it's drought resistant as well and deer resistant. So great for patio gardens and then also uh, it's 24 inches high. So very nice. Hummingbirds like it because it's got a lot of nectar. Uh, Campanula Champion Blend. This one is uh, a very nice purple flower with a pink. Um, <clears throat> very upright, bell-shaped flowers, um, and then just very nice, 32 inches high. So it, it, it actually will stand up quite a bit. That's almost a, a yard. Uh, California poppies. I know there's uh, emerald California poppies, but uh, we find they're just beautiful. And bumblebees absolutely love California poppies. So we have a new color. You can see that how nice it is where mm -hmm. there's uh, a deep orange on the inside. 15 to 25 inches tall, uh, annual hardy, but it, it won't overwinter in, in British Columbia. You need zone eight at least. So, you know, of course, they're California poppies, so they'll overwinter in California and come back. Uh, a new nasturtium. We, we, we found that, you know, our nasturtiums are very nice that we have, but we didn't have a deep, deep color. And this one is, wow, very dark and deep. Black velvet is called. Great for adding a little bit of peppery flavor of, of having some uh, of the, you know, the flower leaves or the, sorry, the flower petals. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then, of course, Bloody Mary. A bit of a <laughs> mixture. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Um, we have uh, a new caramel phlox, which is uh, very nice as cut flowers. We're trying to make it so that you can grow stuff in containers and use them for cut flowers. And it, it thrives in cool weather. It'll actually be more vibrant, the color in cool weather. Uh, sweet violet. <clears throat> so this one is a, a wood violet. Um, oh, it's, uh, there's something very unique about it. Now I forgot what it is. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's very exceptional. I think you can eat the leaves. Um, but don't quote me on that because uh, I don't have the information right here. Uh, 
uh, Napita, uh, Pink Panther, so Cat Mint. Uh, we have two types now. There's the blue and there's the pink. Cat Mint is very nice. <clears throat> African Violets. So African Violets are great indoor plants. You know, they'll grow for 40 years. However, they, the seeds are like dust. It's, uh, you know, in my thumb, the size of my thumb, that's how many, uh, that's 1,500 seeds. Um, if not less, more, you probably fit like 30,000 seeds of, in, in the size of my thumb. Like that's how tiny they are. You actually need to have African violet uh, starter mix, which is very, very fine starter mix because normal starter mix, the, the, the seeds are so small, they'll just fall down and go down too far and, and won't germ properly. Hmm. But they're exceptional. So we have three varieties. So we have the, uh, the, viol the Zanzibar, we have the Fantasy, and we have variegated, very nice plants. And of course, indoors, they'll grow for 40 years. Once you get them started. Uh, Nasturtium baby rose. So this is an All-American selection winner. Uh, <clears throat> very productive. Uh, and what we really liked is, is see how the leaves are just exceptionally green. Um, and, it, and it just had a very nice upright habit. Cat grass. So we have cat grass, mm -hmm. which is uh, orchard grass. There's my cat again. Uh, orchard grass is uh, used for a ton of different things. And it's the it's food of choice for any butterfly cat lovers. So you can plant this, let it grow tall. You know, not only the cats like it, but, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the butterflies like it. Uh, and then we have pampas grass, two colors. We have white and we have pink. Uh, <clears throat> on our coast, we can grow this uh, all year round and it'll keep on coming back. It is deer resistant. Um, I don't know if anybody ever grabbed uh, some of those, uh, those uh, leaves, but uh, they're sharp. So that helps it from being uh, devoured by uh, uh, critters and they'll grow fairly high. So um, you can use it as a barrier, you know, 10 feet, you can use it as a barrier if you don't want to see the neighbors, or if you don't, you have like uh, something that you don't want to see, you can use that in front of it, it'll keep on growing. And then of course it makes really nice cut dried flowers. You cut those little pom-pom things that they have on top. <laughs> and use those uh, all year round inside. And here's the pink. <clears throat> so growing your own cut flowers. So we, uh, one of our staff members was uh, a florist. So we just gave her some scissors and sent her in the field and she made these amazing bouquets. And um, some of them are, are kind of neat where she added oats that were going to seed or, or millet that were out there. In this next example, she's got oats, dill, uh, eucalyptia, sorry. Eucalyptus, uh, black-eyed Susan's in there. Uh, and this next one, she's got three different types of parsley. <clears throat> of course, salvia, lemon bergamot, nasturtium leaves, and ryegrass. <clears throat> the next option is, is growing your own bird seed. So for us, you know, we look at things, you know, why buy something when you can grow it? Um, you know, planting your, your sunflowers, and instead of trying to harvest it or, or do anything to it, just leave it there, let it go to maturity, the birds will know instinctively when it's ripe and then you'll see them hanging upside down eating the, the bird seed. Kind of neat because it's, it's its own bird feeder. At the end of the year, pull it out, compost it, it's done. Um, lawn solutions. So anybody that has a chafer issue, uh, we have a solution for that. And we also have this thing that we worked on with the city of Richmond for about four years and it's called bee turf. And this is the example of bee turf here. It's got uh, uh, tall fescue, it's got uh, micro clover, alyssum, and it's seven flowers. Um, so it'll grow a, a good, uh, uh, let's say 12 inches, uh, but you can mow it. And then like in the, in the middle of July, you can see where we mowed it, where um, the grass was actually getting, uh, starting to go dormant, but the alyssum just came out and the bees were just all over it, <clears throat> having a field day because they love the, uh, the alyssum flowers. Clover. So we spoke about clover before. Landscapers have been trying to kill it for 50 years and we're bringing it back. So there's nothing better for a lawn than clover because you don't have to fertilize, or fertilize a lawn that has clover in it because why? The clover is fixing nitrogen into the soil freely and easily without anybody doing anything and you can mow it, you can walk on it, you can touch it. And then when you have the little flowers like Elsiki clover, the bees love it. <clears throat> you can actually eat the, the clover, um, but you know it also fixes nitrogen. So we have a variety of them. 
Um, there's a yellow sweet clover, which is a nice yellow. And then, of course, hairy vetch is also tracks bees. So if you, uh, we have some beekeepers that actually planted half an acre of clover and half an acre of buckwheat, and they said they had uh, 400 pounds of honey off of two hives. And I guess your average is 200 pounds. Um, and they were just ecstatic about how much uh, honey they got. Here's just a photo of West Coast Seeds Trial Gardens. So we're open to the public, COVID friendly. <clears throat> um, I wouldn't suggest coming now because it's just a big muddy thing uh, of clay. We don't have things planted out yet, but uh, if, you, if you ever wanna come for a tour, um, we have landscape fabric down to cover for the weeds. And uh, we have raised beds that we show things off and just generally uh, walk around and see our bees see our, uh, our bird garden and see our bee garden <clears throat> and other demonstrations of different varieties that we have. We grow about 300 varieties each year uh, for trial. Here's an example of our staff raised bed. So if you're a full-time staff member, you get a raised bed to be able to, to try and use our seeds so you have better knowledge of how to grow vegetables. And thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, awesome. Alex, do you still uh, take some questions? Sure, of course. Okay, so we have Lina. She asked how to grow peony. How to grow peonies? Yes. Um, peonies. Peonies? <clears throat> um, okay, so that's where I'm limited. I don't know how to grow flowers that well. I know how to grow vegetables. My wife is the flower grower <laughs> person. Um, but uh, I can get information for you if, if uh, you guys want it later on on growing uh, really nice peonies. Um, sure, if you have a pamphlet or something and I can um, put it on our website, um, I'm sure our DIGA members would appreciate that. So, okay, sure, good. Sure. Anything else? Yeah, so again, for Melina, um, okay. regarding the corns, do they, do they have the same nutrition or they have different nutritions? For corn? Yeah, for the corns. The different color varieties. Do they have different nutritional values or are they oh, yeah, pretty much yeah. the same? So the, the colored corn are more ornamental and more like for popping corn. Um, <clears throat> like the the like that really deep Rio Grande is going to have some nice nutrition. I don't have the stats on those ones. Um, mm -hmm. Sweet corn, you know, there'll, there'll be some variation, but uh, they're generally going to be the same, like, you know, the bicolor and the, and the, the, the pure yellow versus the white. It's more sweetness, um, uh, different levels of sweetness, where you have the super sweet versus the, uh, um, the triple sweet and some other varieties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Owen from Facebook um, said, for bagger growing, is there a guide that can, that come you, sorry. So for, bag, for backyard growing, is there a guide that comes to mind that mentioned the animals and pollinators that attract to each plant because it has animals uh, in its backyard day and night? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's tough. Uh, one suggest if there's deer, deer fencing. <clears throat> if it's uh, different animals, there's there's different products on there. Like if you have cats coming into the yard to use uh, the washroom, there's there's certain things you can do. Where <clears throat> I've seen that where they have um, uh, it's it's best to Google it. Where you're looking at uh, garden centers, you can see some of the stuff because generally a garden center in your area will know what the pests are or the uh, the predator animals or like raccoons and sometimes there's nothing you can do you know like you know you grow sweet corn in the city of vancouver realistically uh, raccoons come in the day that it's mature i remember trying to grow grapes and uh, a lot of grapes in, in port moody <clears throat> and i'd be extremely you know excited oh it's sunday and i tested it oh it's gonna be ready maybe like tuesday wednesday i come back tuesday it's all gone because the 40 pound raccoon knew the same thing and he came at two in the morning and ate it all. So it's, it's a, it's a tough one where, yeah, you're feeding the animals, but um, uh, yeah, there's no real guide on it. it. It's just helpful information on Google, in my opinion, where you, you share information. If you're, if you're a 
Facebook, you might want to join the local uh, garden group or the garden fanatics. So like, for instance, if you're in Vancouver, the garden fanatics in Vancouver and then search their posts because a lot of people will have the same challenges in the same area and you can see how they dealt with it. An example is rats. We live in the coast. We live by the ocean. There's rats. And, uh, you know, how do you protect against that besides, you know, having cats and other things that are outside? <clears throat> predators that will keep them away um, but you know the animals are hungry they're gonna they're gonna try right yeah hopefully that answered that awesome thank you very much no more questions okay anyway that was that was great alex i think we all learned a lot and uh yeah if you could um, get that information to me about different flowers or anything um that you would find helpful pertaining to this information, I can post it on our Facebook page and our website, and we can also all benefit from it. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so, if there's no more questions, I think we can call it a day. Thank you very much, Alex. Oh, Alex, thanks. That was great. Thanks so much. Yeah.